Yep. Hey, Bene. Good morning, my relatives. How are you doing today? Today is uh, Tuesday, March 12th. I'm sitting here with my second cup of coffee, and there's a few things I wanted to talk about this morning. It's almost noon here on the East Coast. It's a little bit before noon, but it's still morning, so uh, I'm enjoying my cup of coffee. But uh, before I begin, let me just do like always, which is acknowledge I'm speaking to you from Piscataway lands. And I just want to thank the Piscataway Bay for the stewardship of these lands. They're now called Washington, D.C., but I want to honor the Piscataway Bay as the host of these lands. And I want to just remind myself and everyone how humble we need to carry and conduct ourselves, knowing that we are walking on indigenous lands wherever we go across uh, Turtle Island. So thank you for joining this morning. Um, if you notice, I, I wear glasses every now and then. I actually have reading glasses Uh and I've been slowly <laughs> wearing them more and more as my I'm getting a little bit older. My eyesight's getting a little less sharp as it used to be. And I had something happen the other day that I've never had before, which is someone actually commented on my glasses and said they liked them. And so it actually took me a little by surprise. I was at the dentist's office and someone said, oh, I like your glasses. And I rarely put any thought into like the style of my glasses or how they look. I mainly just kind of grab whatever I can see best through, but uh, my wife agreed. She said, yeah, these glasses look fairly good on your face. So I don't know, maybe maybe they're a good pair. Um, unfortunately, they keep breaking. The screw has come loose twice now. Um, amazingly, I haven't lost it yet, but anyway, such is the um, <laughs> challenges of wearing reading glasses. But um, thank you for joining me today, my relatives. Let me see who is online here. Uh, Tracy, yat a bene, and George, yat a. Thank you for joining this morning. It's good to have both of you on here. I appreciate you taking time to join me for um, my second cup of coffee. Wherever you might be, this might be your first cup of your favorite morning beverage, or maybe it's your second or even your third. I don't know, but thank you for joining me this morning. There's a few things I want to talk about, um, and uh, as you know, I like to read my news. I like to go through and kind of hunt my news, looking at my different websites, where I get my news from. And I saw an article today. It's an issue that I've addressed in the past, but I wanted to bring it up. It's actually regarding the U.S. Constitution, although I don't recall it, uh, the article actually referencing the Constitution. Tracy, hey, thanks for joining again. Um, oh, your first cup. Yeah, glad to see you're starting out good with us this morning. Um, anyway, so let me share this article. It was found on the AP website and it's titled, uh, equal education, unequal pay. Why is there still a gender pay gap in 2024? And the article, um, points out to data coming out of the most recent census. And I'm just going to read a short paragraph from this article. Rather than comparing full-time working men to full-time working women, the February 22nd Census Bureau report juxtaposes men and women with same education caliber. Graduates of certificate degree programs and those who have held bachelor's degrees from the most selective universities, explained economist Kendall Hunton, a co-author of the research. Um, the report also includes graduates who may have opted out um, of the labor force, such as women taking on child care responsibilities. But what they found is that even when they compare men and women who have the same level of education, there was still a gap in pay in, in how much uh, they were earning, what they were being paid for their jobs. And I encourage you to read the article because it actually looks at the problem, right? Most of the research we've seen in the past, looking at pay gaps, looks at men and women working similar jobs. Um, but this actually compares men and women with the same level of education in, in similar work who are act still being paid different uh, rates of pay. And it, it wrestles and even shares the story of a few women and how they've handled it. And one woman in the article said, yeah, she's actually found that she has to change jobs frequently, right? If she can't get a promotion or a raise from her current employer, she needs to look for work elsewhere so that she can continue to rise in her field um, because she's not finding um, those promotions coming as quickly from her when she stays with the same employer over time. So anyway, um, 
interesting challenge. I, I, what caught my eye is the title of the article is Unequal Education, on, or Equal Education, Unequal Pay. Why is there still a gender pay gap in 2024? Now, for those who follow me on social media, for those who've read my book on Selling Truth, for those who have heard me lecture on this, you know, and those who follow my 2020 campaign, right? One of the things I point out at the very start of my lectures and at the beginning of my book, right, which is we have these foundations, our founding documents. We have a Declaration of Independence that says all men are created equal. And then it defines men as a white landowning male right? It doesn't say women. It says men. Joe Biden loves to misquote the declaration. He loves to say, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. I do not disagree, but that's not what our document says. Same thing with the constitution, right? And I'll just go through some of these constitutional um, phrases where if if we look at our constitution, right, the preamble, again, it sounds inclusive, we, the people of the United States, are to form a more, more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. This is the preamble to the Constitution. It sounds inclusive. You read just a few lines later, Article 1, Section 2, just a, literally just a few lines later, this is the section that determines who is and who is not included in this document, who is and who is not protected by this Constitution. If you read Article 1, Section 2, you have to note that Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution does not mention women. Now, this is important because if you read the entire document, from the preamble all the way down to the 27th Amendment, you will find that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns, 51 he, him, and his, who can run for office, who can hold office, even who's protected by the document. There is not a single female pronoun in the entire Constitution. Second, Article 1, Section 2 specifically excludes natives. Third, it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. So in 1787, who does that leave? You take away women, you take away natives, you take away African people, right? Black people in 1787, who's left? You're left with white men. And technically, it was a white landowning male who could vote. You had to own land. And so we don't acknowledge this about our Constitution. The reason it was written, right? The purpose of the Constitution is to protect white landowning men. And the majority of our Supreme Court jurists right now, from both the left and the right, are originalists. People whose goal, whose interpretation method of the Constitution is to get into the mindset, into the psyche of the original authors. What were they thinking when they wrote this document? Well, those authors were not thinking of including women. And so I tell my my audiences when I speak, right? So we act surprised. We literally act surprised when we see a gender wage gap. This isn't surprising. It's not surprising that men earn more than women. The Constitution, which is the basis of all of our laws, does not mention women. It was written to protect white landowning men. That is the purpose of the Constitution. So if we want to fix the gender pay gap, right, if we want to fix that problem, it's not just about educating people more. It's not just about passing, you know, looking at HR policies. We must address the Constitution. We have to. We have to address the Constitution. And we're not addressing it. And so it's no surprise, right? So I, and I'm disappointed that the author, who apparently the author writes about the pay gap and, and women's uh, employment issues frequently, do, never mentions the Constitution. If we don't fix it at the foundational level, we're never going to see the fruit up at the top. So anyway, again, that's why I ran for president in 2020. The goal of my campaign was to build a nation where we the people actually means all the people. I wanted to address our founding documents. I want to edit the Constitution. In the show notes for this episode, I will put a link there. Um, I don't have it right in front of me. I should have grabbed it beforehand. But uh, a few years ago, when I read the Constitution, one of the first times I read it as an adult, 
And I was appalled at how frequently um, we use male specific pronouns, he, him, and his. I started counting them. I found 51. We specifically exclude natives, right? We count Africans as three-fifths of a person. Slavery is still legal. Instead of amending the Constitution, I propose that we edit it. And so I went through the Constitution with a strike-through font. Every place, I, if I found the phrases like the president he or the senator he or his words or whatever it said, so the, one of those male pronouns, I replaced it with a gender-neutral or a proper noun, a gender neutral pronoun or a proper noun. I just took out all the he, him, and his. And if we want to fix our laws, if we want to fix the gender pay gap, we have to start by addressing it in the Constitution. And I'll put the link to that edited version of the Constitution in the show notes. So you can look at it a little bit later. But yeah, that that's where we have to fix it. I didn't change balance of powers. I didn't change checks and balances. I merely edited out the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy that is written into our foundations. I actually made the Constitution say what most people think it already says, which is that people are created equal and should be treated equally. But it doesn't actually say that. So anyway, I was um, I, I saw that article this morning and I thought I would highlight it because it's an important thing to remember. Um, why we have to address these at a more foundational level. So if you want to see more about my writing on this, I encourage you, uh, I, you, can, you can read my book, the book I co-authored, Unsettling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy, The Doctrine of Discovery. Um, I talk more about it in there. I also um, have my Patreon. If you want to um, actually support the work that I'm trying to do, you can subscribe to me on Patreon. I talk about these issues and many others on my Patreon frequently, and so you can uh, subscribe to me there. And for those of you who are interested in my Patreon, I want to just give you my schedule a little bit for this next month. Um, but uh, coming up in the month of March, I have several kind of tiered events that I host on my Patreon uh, um, site. And on March 21st, I am going to be doing my Zoom call with members of the Decolonizing Faith tier. Um, and this is where I discuss content from my, my upcoming book. That same tier is the tier where I did a 12-month uh, book study with Sing Chan Ra. And every month we went to a separate chapter of the book. So even if you just want to subscribe for one month to that uh, tier, you can binge all 12 videos of Sing Chan and I doing a book study going through on Selling Truths. On March 27th, about a week later at 8 p.m. in the evening Eastern time, I'm doing my monthly Q&A. And that's just a chance to jump on a line in a Zoom call with people subscribed to my Patreon to the Ask Questions tier and just to answer questions about things I've said, about my schedule, about uh, the book I wrote or the work I'm doing or videos I put out. Um, it's just a way to kind of take the conversation a little bit deeper. So if you're interested in following me on Patreon, and that's a great way to support the work I'm doing, I do my best. I don't monetize my YouTube channel or my other social media because I don't want advertisers having any say over uh, what content I discuss or, or how I present things. And so I don't monetize those things, even though you may see advertisements. If you watch my YouTube channel, I'm not getting any money from that because I've not monetized that. And so I use my Patreon as the best way to subscribe to and support the work I'm doing. Anyway, moving on, and let me just see if I'm missing any comments here. Uh, let's see who is still on. Um, Brian, hey, thanks for adding your comment. Yes, the systemic issues um, of the patriarchy are exposed, and that's what we need to deal with. They're written into our founding documents, and we need to deal with them there. Um, I saw another article the other day, and there's several articles I'm going to share here. I'm going to go back. I had to trace this down. The first article I saw just came across in my, new, my news feed, and it was about um, uh, long COVID. Now, perhaps those of you and those of us, I, I actually had COVID a few months ago over Christmas, just before Christmas, I got COVID. Um, but uh, but. For those of you who have had COVID or you have family members who have COVID, you know that a certain percentage of people experience what they've termed as long COVID. 
Um, now, before I begin this conversation, I just may need to be absolutely clear. I'm not a medical physician. I'm not medically trained. Nothing about this is medical advice. I'm just sharing some articles that I've read and I think some things that bring up some interesting points that might you want to read more about and kind of research for yourself. But um, there was a report that came out recently on long COVID. And in the report, they found that low blood iron levels might be contributing to uh, what they call long COVID, you know, where people get easily fatigued and they have other issues that go on, um, a, lot of, a lot of just feeling really tired and there's other symptoms as well. But there was a report that came out. And so I'm first going to share this article from the U.S. News and World Report website. And they have an article um, regarding this report that came out. And just a few of the things they mentioned um, in the study, researchers uh, took 214 COVID patients. They found that ongoing inflammation and low iron levels in blood can be seen as early as two weeks post-infection in those who went on to develop long COVID um, symptoms even months later. Uh, they quoted one of the authors of the report and said that iron levels and the way the body regulates iron were disrupted early on during COVID-19 infections. Our SARS COVID COV2 infections and took a long time to recover, particularly in those people who went on to report long COVID months later. Um, and they said, although we saw evidence that the body was trying to rectify low iron availability and the resulting anemia by producing more red blood cells, it was not doing a particularly good job of it in the face of ongoing inflation. Or inflammation, sorry, not inflation, inflammation. Um, the, another one of the authors, uh, a, a researcher, also explained that iron deficiency is a natural response to infection and a common consequence of inflammation. And so, yeah, basically they studied over 200 people who had COVID and they found that there was a disruption in the way that their body dealt with and produced iron. And they're speculating if that might have to do with some of the symptoms that are in uh, long COVID. So I want to, again, I'm not a medical professional, um, and I just want to share these articles because, like you, I know a lot of people who have long COVID, and there's always a lot of kind of um, bewilderment of what's going on and why are they feeling the way they feel so long after. So um, here is a link to the actual study. The study was published in Nature.com. It was called Iron Dysregulation and Inflammatory Stress in ethropocysis associates with long-term outcome of COVID-19. I know I pronounced that one word wrong. Um, and I, you know me, I, I love to read like uh, um, Supreme Court uh, opinions and doing that. Um, I will confess, I was not able to read much of this report. Uh, medical terms really throw me off, and I'm just, I, I had a hard time. I wanted to give it to you so you can research it further, um, but I was able to glean a lot more from the different articles I read about, uh, about this study. Um, but I wanted to make sure I shared with you the actual study um, that was published in nature.com. I also want to share with you this link, and the researchers, I believe, came from the University of Cambridge, and uh, the University of Cambridge actually uh, published a story about this as well, and they referenced Dr. Amy Hansen, who is uh, one of the researchers on the study, um, and it, said, it says, Dr. Amy Hansen, who worked in the study while at the University of Cambridge and is now at the University of Bristol, said iron levels and the way the body regulates iron were disrupted early on during SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and this is, again, this is the quote I read earlier um, and took a very long time to recover. Um, and so this just explains a little bit more, but I would recommend that you go through and read this article. Um, in this article, they actually point to potential ways of preventing or reducing the impact of long COVID. And again, these are for the medical profession, not for what we can do individually from what I'm gathering. 
but it says the researchers of the study point to potential ways of preventing or reducing the impact of long COVID by rectifying iron dysregulation in early COVID-19 to prevent adverse long-term health outcomes. One approach might be controlling the extreme inflammation as early as possible before it impacts on iron regulation. Um, another approach might involve iron supplement, supplements or supplementation. However, as Dr. Hansen pointed out, this may not be <clears throat> straightforward. So again, none of this is medical advice on my part. I'm just showing you these articles and I encourage you to read them because like you, I've been really kind of mystified by what causes long COVID and what, what is, why is it happening and why do so many people experience it? And this is one of the first studies I found that actually pointed to something that seemed fairly solid. And so I wanted to share that with you. I welcome you to do more research into it and to, uh, you know, at least you'll have a bit more knowledge. If you really want to get into the into the weeds with this, you can read the study that I shared up top at nature.com, and that will give you all of the things that they, that they looked at in the study. So anyway, um, that is one of the things I wanted to discuss. The last thing I wanted to discuss today, and this was an article I saw a few weeks ago, and it's regarding artificial intelligence. I haven't done a, 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 a show yet specifically on artificial intelligence. I'm reading about it. I'm actually kind of learning about it and trying to, I've even tried chat GBT a few times and experimenting some with it. I don't yet know enough to say anything definitive or to even give much of an opinion on it. Um, there's people on both sides, some people who love it, other people who are scared to death of it. And I think it's something we have to approach with caution. But this story caught my eye. It was in, um, in a, a publication called Air uh, Technica. I believe that's a Canadian publication. And I'm going to put this uh, in the in the chat as well. And the re, the report, or the article was titled, Air Canada Must Honor Refund Policy Invented by the Airlines Chatbot. <laughs> so apparently what happened is there was a passenger who was researching, flight, researching flights because someone in their family died and they wanted to travel um, to get there. And they were looking up the bereavement policies of Air Canada. And they put they asked the chatbot, and we've all worked with the chatbots on these different websites, and right, they give us quick answers. They're not a live person there. They're just an AI that's responding to our questions and sharing resources with us. And so we asked the AI, or they asked the chatbot about, uh, this was Air Canada's chatbot, they asked them about um, the, uh, the bereavement policies of purchasing tickets, and the chatbot told him that um, he could buy the tickets and then submit for a refund up to 90 days later. So he did that. He bought the tickets, submitted them for a refund 90 days later. And Eric Canada came back and said, actually, that's not our policy. Um, we do not refund for bereavement. Um, you have to apply for it before you purchase your ticket, not after. And they offered to promise to correct their chat bot and to uh, give him, I think, a $200 voucher. And he declined and went to, uh, I think, what was a small claims court. And so a few things interesting about this article it said, according to Air Canada, uh, Mofat, uh, the, the guy who bought the ticket, never should have trusted the chatbot and the airline should not be liable for the chatbot's misleading information because Air Canada essentially argued that the chatbot is a separate legal entity that is responsible for its own actions. Experts told the Vancouver Sun that Moffat's case appeared to be the first time a, com a Canadian company tried to argue that it wasn't liable for information provided in its, by its chatbot. Tribunal member Christopher Rivers, who decided the case in favor of Moffat, called Air Canada's defense remarkable. Air Canada argues it cannot be held liable for information provided by one of its agents, servants, or representatives, including a chatbot, Rivers wrote. It does not explain why it believes that that is the case or why the webpage titled Bereavement Travel was inherently more trustworthy than its chatbot. So basically, the, the, the judges or the, the court ordered in are ruled in favor of the passenger and said, yes, you, Air Canada, are liable for what your 
AI chatbot told the customer, um, right? And and uh, Air Canada was arguing and saying, well, the chatbot actually sent a link to a web page that gave the full bereavement policy, and they should have read the web page, and they should have found that they could not have uh, applied for the the discount after they already purchased the ticket. And basically the judge says, why should they trust your web page more than they would trust your chatbot? They're both a computer representing policies of your company. Why would the website be more inherently trustworthy than the chatbot, which you set up to answer people's questions when they're, they're coming to your website? And so they ruled in favor of the passenger. And I thought I'd actually applaud that, right? I absolutely think I, I, there's a lot of benefits that can come from AI, but I think if we allow companies who are going to put these things more and more on the customer service end of the, the, the things that we interact with, and we're going to be getting more and more information and details from these AI-driven chatbots, right? The companies need to be told, yeah, you're liable for what you're AI enhanced chatbot is going to tell your customers. And if it tells them something wrong or incorrect, you're still going to be held accountable for that. So I actually applaud what the courts in Canada did and they ruled in favor of the passenger um, and uh, held the corporation accountable for what, uh, what it told the passenger. Anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, just a few things to think about as we enter into this new technological phase of really of world history where uh, we are interacting more and more frequently, sometimes even without knowing it, with artificial intelligence or with AI, which are driving a lot of the information that we're seeing or that we're getting in automated text and, and, and chats and things like that. So... Um, at some point in the future, I'm going to do an episode specifically on AI and maybe even have a guest on who's done some thinking about this as well. But uh, I just wanted to share that story with you. I thought it was, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, that's kind of what's going on right now. Uh, I want to share one other thing with you. If you listen to my uh, um my last second cup of coffee, or if you follow me on social media, you'll know that uh, in April, I'm going to be going to the premiere of a documentary I was involved in. Um, the title of the documentary is called Bad Indian Hiding in Antelope Canyon. And it's about a family. Um, they run a tour uh, company um, in, in, on um, near the Navajo nation and Navajo family. And it's about one of their ancestors or one of their relatives who actually hid out in the canyons, um, on our reservation or near, in our lands, um, to avoid going to Bosco Dondo or to the long walk. And it's about his journey. And they asked me to come and provide some of my research um, in an interview regarding Abraham Lincoln and regarding um, the, uh, the long walk. And so I shared the link with you to their, the website. It's going to be premiering on April 12, 13, and 14 at the Phoenix Film Festival. And uh, I'm going to be there. They're, they're actually flying me in to attend the film festival. And after each of the showings, we're going to be having a Q&A. And I'll be on a panel of other people involved with the film to answer questions during the Q&A. And so I'm really excited about that. If you'd like to see a trailer for the film, um, I'm going to put that uh, link to the trailer into here right now as well. Again, it's called Bad Indian Hiding in Antelope Canyon. And this is a trailer for the documentary that's coming out uh, in uh, at the film festival. So anyway, something I was uh, very honored to be involved in and I'm looking forward to coming out. And I hope it really helps move the conversation forward, not just about our Navajo people and the long walk, but really educating our nation about the role, the despicable role that Abraham Lincoln played um, in the genocide and ethnic cleansing um, of native peoples from Turtle Island. So anyway, those are my thoughts this morning, my relatives. I hope your second cup of coffee is as good as mine is. I hope you have a wonderful day. Walk in beauty, my relatives. And may we all learn how to walk in beauty together.
Hakone.